Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the finale of our first round of Loden Sports Outlier Sessions. My name is Matt Pajak, co-founder of Loden Sports. Quick plug on what Loden Sports is. We are the affordable human performance data provider. We use non-exclusive objective athletic evaluations for the purposes of tracking athletic development, informing athlete health, and identifying outliers. Our evaluations are non-sport, gender, skill level, or age specific. They are for anyone and everyone, just like these outlier sessions. If you're interested in learning more or getting in touch, visit our website at www.loadinsports.com. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Loadinsports and read our blog, which is also available through our website. I do also want to throw a shout out to our friends at Yellow Box Macaroons, the first unofficial sponsor of the Loadin Sports Outlier Sessions. If you're a fan of sweet treats, their hand curated coconut macaroons are a must. Continuing on the tradition of Jackie Weiss, Yellow Box Macaroons is the most delicious box of macaroons in the world. If you don't like coconut or macaroons, that's on you. Make your New Year's resolution macaroons. Find your next box on www.yellowboxmacaroons.com or on Instagram at yellowboxmacaroons. The Outlier Sessions have been created as a way to bridge the gap and create a connection between the aspiring and the achieving. All of our guests have a niche at the highest levels of baseball and are an outlier in their own right. We want to take some time to talk about long-term athlete development in the context of their experiences, their processes for taking care of themselves, and get to know a little bit more about their personal interests as well. With all that being said, we know there are so many other places you could be right now, and we want to thank you for being here with us. We hope you're able to take something you learn here and apply it in your life. The session will be broken into two parts. For the first part, we'll have a series of questions for our guest, and for the second part, for anyone who's hanging around, we'll invite you to join the conversation. And now, a rare member of the two-time first-round pick club and the oldest of three damn good baseball playing brothers, I'd like to introduce Matt McLean. Thank you for joining us this evening. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for having me on. Excited to get going on it. Yeah, absolutely. Love your energy. <laughs> um, I just had a uh, a smoothie, so I'm fired up. <laughs> fired up off that smoothie. Yeah, it was a cold brew smoothie. The guy didn't tell me that there was coffee in it. <laughs> I like just drank it. This is the energy we need because out here on the East Coast, it's already past nine o'clock. So <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Um, you want to just start by providing a little background on yourself, you know, how old you are, where you're from, uh, <clears throat> yeah. high school and college you went to, all that. Yeah. So I'm 22 years old from Orange County, California, born and raised here, um, in Tustin, went to Beckman high school, um, and then in Irvine and then went to UCLA, um, and then got drafted by the Reds this past year. And I played in high A with the Dayton Dragons, um, I just finished up there, so I'm kind of in my first off season, and I'm getting ready to go for uh, spring training. Well, let's go. We just got to get uh, <laughs> we got to get this CBA figured out so that we can get back to baseball on time. <laughs> yeah, seriously, I think the minor league. I haven't heard anything yet, but I think the minor league um, spring training is still going to happen on time. That's right. like regardless of what be. happens at the major league level. You guys would be a full go. Yeah. Well, you just don't want to move too fast through the system. Because you know you might get you might be ready for the call up <laughs> before the big league guys are back in action. <laughs> There's a lot of work till that's there. Um, <laughs> before we really get going, a couple of things I do want to call out. Matt will be hooking up someone in the audience, maybe multiple someone's in the audience, uh, who fill out the Google form that's in the Outlier Session chat. Uh, he said he has a baseball and maybe a couple cards, so fill that out, and we will contact winners most likely tomorrow. Additionally, we will be sending out an email in the next day or so for all attendees to claim their free POAP NFT for this session. For those of you who aren't familiar, a POAP is basically a digital ticket stub. If you're interested in receiving the email, please fill out the Google form. Again, post it in the Outlier session chat. All right, let's do this. Load in Sports is in the process of building an LTAD, and as such, we're going to open this up with a couple of our staple LTAD-related questions about emotional well-being and ignition. Our LTAD will be inclusive, holistic, and a philosophical reference guide for developing athletes of all sports and levels of aspiration. In our eyes, everyone is an athlete. Yes, even the parents and coaches. Let's hit on emotional well-being and the importance of gratefulness. There are little things we can do every day to bolster our emotional well-being. It's like a muscle, needs to be trained. This is something that everyone can do every day. 
It's great for shared card rides or dinner tables. Matt, what are three things you are grateful for today? Um, God, friends, family. Boom. Simple man. Simple man. Simple man <laughs> all hyped up on his, on his smoothie. And <laughs> he hits you with <laughs> keeping it real simple. I'm going to go a little bit more complex because I do this every single day. So, you okay. know. The, the high level ones are, you know, I used those years ago, but <laughs> um, <laughs> direct flights because you appreciate them more when you have long layovers or connectors. And especially mm -hmm. in today's day and age when flights are getting banged left and right, uh, if you yeah. have a direct flight as opposed to two flights, then cuts your chances of losing a flight in half. Um, two tangible books might be a weird one, but there's something about having a book in your hands as opposed to on a tablet or something of that nature. And then three, and you don't really have to worry about this, um, because it's never gray season out in Southern California, but indoor plants to provide some color during the dead season here in North Carolina. Um, <laughs> yep. So anyway, gratefulness, it's important. Uh, recommend that everyone do it. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> our second LTAD related question is part of the reason why Matt is on here and with us today. Let's talk about ignition and our LTAD ignition is a key pillar to athlete development. It's what lights the fire for the developing athlete to want to participate in sports. Matt, uh, talk a little bit about who or what in your life helped drive the interest in the sport of baseball for you when you were younger, and then kind of talk about the people or maybe some of the moments when you were growing up that kind of sparked that interest? Yeah. So I grew up, like I kind of played every sport. I played uh, baseball when it was baseball season, football, basketball, and soccer. So I was always like playing something and sometimes like two sports. Um, no one really pushed me towards baseball necessarily. They, they kind of just, my parents put me in every sport or put all of us in every sport and kind of said, whatever you like, just keep playing. They never force us to do anything. Um, but I always liked baseball and football the most for sure. I was, <clears throat> I was best at baseball. And then in high school, I played baseball and football. And then, um, after my sophomore year, I just played baseball, but just like growing up playing at the little league, like with my friends, like we were all went, all went to the same elementary school, played in the same little league. And then outside of little league, it was um, a travel team called the Diamond Devils. And like we were all, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a good group of guys. And we we're all like super close. So it was always fun. It was never like, um, you know, I'm, I'm tired of baseball or anything like that. It was almost seen as like, you know, go have fun. We'd practice on like Friday, Saturday, and then like play Sundays and like tournaments out in like West Covina, the in Inland Empire. There was like big tournaments out there every weekend. Um, and we go have a lot of fun and play and we're all super close. So I always had fun playing baseball and always could feel like I could bond, bond with my teammates and, and, you know, hang out with them outside of baseball as well. Um, so I don't know, baseball's always just been fun and the sport's fun too as well. But the people surrounding baseball that I've met are, uh, now like still some of my best friends and, uh, I continue to meet people in baseball, whether it's coaches, mentors, or you know, anyone around baseball. I don't know. I just seem to connect with them probably because I play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> that would make sense. Um, <laughs> no, but that's awesome. Did you, you didn't have any like a favorite player growing up or you an angels fan? Um, <laughs> am I an angels fan? Uh, like I grew up watching them play, but no reds fan, <laughs> I go. guess if you want to call guess, it that, I guess I, that was a layup. Um, I saw that one coming, but, <laughs> You were an Angels fan growing up, or did you have a favorite player? Maybe it wasn't on the Angels, but... Um, no, not really. Um, I grew up watching Trout, like, a lot. Not really growing up, but, like, middle school, high school, like, going to the games and just watching them was sick. Oh, so you've always been a Reds fan, and you were a big fan of Jay Bruce growing up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, there you go. You gotta play the company line sometimes, you know? Yeah, he could hit bombs. I know that. Yeah, Bruce raked for a couple of years. Yeah. Votto's still going. But, yeah, uh, he mashes. Your uh, your dad played football at UCLA. Yeah. Um, you said you played football in high school. Was, it ever, uh -huh. was there ever a shot that football was going to be that sport for you, or was it always baseball? It was always baseball, because I was going to UCLA 
um, kind of like right after my sophomore year of football. Like I committed to UCLA like that winter and football season's in the fall, but it was always baseball. I mean, I was, I was playing football and then going to do scout ball on, on Sundays. I really didn't, I hit um, and stuff during the fall when I was playing football. Um, I would hit during the week, like practice sometimes, um, and then just go play on Sundays to kind of keep in shape. So I'd go Friday night football game, wake up, be sore, kind of do nothing on Saturday, and then Sunday go play. Dedicated to the craft. It was so fun. Like that 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 part of my life was so fun, just because I love like I lo- I love football. I like uh I was a corner and I love I love guarding people. This is why everyone likes Matt McLean because he just he just has such a excitement for life and an excitement for playing. Like you're, you sound like <laughs> a little kid. I know. It's awesome. It's just fun to like. I don't know. I just like competing. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, let's talk a little bit more about your family. You know, obviously, I just mentioned your dad. Uh, uh-huh. Your mom was also what? She was a softball player. Softball and volleyball. Yeah. So um, that was kind of. It's not surprising that you're the oldest of three brothers that are all division one baseball players. Um, you're the two time first round pick more on that later. You have a brother at Arizona state who suited up for team USA this past summer. And you have uh-huh. a brother who just got to campus at UCLA. You're all within yep. three years of each other. What was that like growing up from a competitive standpoint? Do you think that helped your baseball development at all? Maybe more so them? Um, no, uh, no. I mean, like, we're all super competitive in everything we do. Like they were all Sean went up back up to school like two days ago. Nick went up to school uh two day get two days ago as well. So it was like fun having them back, but it definitely helped us. Like we were always just messing around wrestling. It made us tougher for sure. Um but like even in basketball, like we all suck. But like it was just like fun competing against them and like finding that competitive edge and like I think it definitely helped us on and off the field for sure. Yeah. And you just kind of touched on it there. You know, obviously uh, that kind of answers the question, but you had a built in baseball support group and you still do, you know, moving forward, you know, through your playing career, you automatically have people who can kind of get what you're going through under the same roof as you. But, you know, surely during the pandemic lockdown, it helped to have your brothers under one roof to keep pushing you forward. <laughs> I think a lot oh, of yeah. people were, were grasping at like, all right, how do I do this by myself? And <laughs> you had two brothers who, you know, were there to keep you pushing. I know. Yeah. That was one thing that uh, saved us through it is we always were doing something, even if we had to stay in the house or kind of stay away from stores or whatever the rules were, we were always doing something in the house. It was never boring. So I remember thinking it at the time and I've never brought this up with you and and I've never heard anyone else reference this, but I figure there's no better time than the present. Uh, (laughs) Some of the parallels are kind of funny between you guys and the ball family. Southern California, (laughs) all within three years, all really good at their sport, even down to multiple UCLA commitments. Has anyone ever brought that up with you guys? Uh Uh-uh. They're a little more advanced than us as of now. Um, they got two guys in the league and one of them in the G League. So they're a little more advanced as of right now. But yeah, that's interesting. I never thought of it like that. I never thought of the... I didn't know they were in three years. Yeah, I think you guys are a little bit tighter uh, age-wise, but they, they uh-huh. played together in high school. And that's, that's kind of what made me think of it because I remember that you played with... Nick and Sean, your senior year, right? Yeah, Nick was a freshman. Sean was a junior, yeah. Yeah, so I think they had LaMelo play up. I think he was technically in eighth grade, but he was playing on the high school varsity team um, Lonzo's senior year. But it was just kind of funny because Lonzo was committed to UCLA. Um, I think at the time, LiAngelo was uncommitted. And at the time I was thinking about this, like Sean was still uncommitted. And then... Uh, Lamelo was committed to UCLA, and I think when did Nick commit to UCLA? Uh, I want to say freshman year. I no, 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 it wasn't. It was sophomore year. Was it before Sean committed to Arizona State? I have no clue. Yeah, for some. I'm reason, pretty sure it was after. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was after. 
either way, I just it was funny because you know obviously you guys are all from Southern California and all really good at the same sport. All played together in high school and then all went to Pac-12 schools and yeah, it's just <laughs> it, it's just a funny one. But um, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna have you uh, put your scout hat on here for a second. Let's okay. go through the five tools in baseball and tell me which brother has the best reach. And you're going to have to do your best to be unbiased <laughs> and honest here, right? <laughs> okay. Um, who's the best runner out of the three? Me. That's a fact. <laughs> Sean's close. Sean's close. Nick thinks he's the fastest, but Sean's close to me. Um, have you been... Since we had our conversation in early December, have you been bully pr- uh, bulletproofing the hammies? Yes, slowly building up. I shut down for about 10 days because of COVID. So this is actually my first week back of lifting. Um, and I feel good. But I was running two, three times a week, two times. And then got COVID and just completely racked it. And then started up again this week. And I feel pretty good. I'm really sore. Maybe. But feel good. Maybe the sprinting is what gave you COVID. No. <laughs> it might have. Don't say that. <laughs> um, all right, let's get back on track here. All right, best arm. Me. <laughs> Nick's got a good arm. Yeah. Nick's, Nick's got a good arm, and he's a lefty, so he, he gets a point yeah. for that. But he, um, like, we all pitched a little bit. Like, nothing serious, but he's definitely the highest on the radar gun off the mound. Um, defense. Me. <laughs> all right, all right. I'll, I'll, I, can, I can attest to that one. You know, you, you played shortstop <laughs> at UCLA, and before you were playing shortstop, you were playing center field. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that one for sure. Not that I want to be the first two, but... <laughs> all, right, all right this one i feel like has a chance raw power me <laughs> raw power like sean has like seriously matured ever since he got to college like physically uh and nick's just nick's the big like the biggest but i got the best in-game juice like bp maybe not me but when you put me in a game i'm gonna hit it further than them and harder. All right, I'll, I'll I'll take your word for you. Take your word for it. But I thought, <laughs> I thought Sean had some juice. Maybe he's just getting the the benefit of that thin air down in Arizona. Yeah, he had seven this past year. Um. Yeah, I always tell him that. I'm like, dude, like you're at ASU. Like it's also I also didn't know that it was above uh, sea level. There. Well, you're, and Jackie, it just doesn't fly at all. You're uh you're learning me too because I didn't realize it was above sea level either. I just assumed because of the arid climate that that was the reason why the ball <laughs> flew out of there. But yeah, oh yeah, well, yeah, that part's a good part to hit at. Uh, last tool, hit tool, pure hit. Me. <laughs> all right. So I know. Sweep. I know. I said me on all of them. Clean sweep. Clean sweep. <laughs> uh, you know what? There's no lack of confidence. And that's what, <laughs> what do you here. think? If if I want to hear your opinion. Well, I didn't see Nick play enough. Okay, um, fair enough. But he's a completely different animal because he's, you know, left. Does he hit right? Yeah, he's switch. Yeah, so like he's got a little bit of a little lefty in him, throws left. You know, he's kind of limited in where he can play on the field. Like he doesn't really have a chance you know, where he doesn't have a chance to show what he can do at shortstop or in center field. And yeah. Are like, you know, the prime position. He can really like, track it down in the outfield though. I'll give him that. Is he's like, like pretty legit out there. Yeah. I think, you know, you give him, but a again, he's not a shortstop. It's kind of hard to compare. You know, you and you and Sean, like you, you could be twins. Um, uh-huh. Yeah. I don't know where Nick came from, but <laughs> <laughs> He uh, he's a little bit bigger, so you know, give it a couple of years, and he might have you on on arm and raw power. Yeah, he's pretty solid. But yeah, I I think I'd agree with you on uh, all five tools right now. But that that's how it should be because you're the one who just got drafted. Yeah, I'm also. Team, so 
older than them. Yeah. Uh, let's look into your crystal ball real quick. Do you think Sean adds a third first round draft selection to the McLean tapestry in 2022? Yeah, he's good enough to, for sure. Um, he's got to play well. Things got to line up. You know, the draft's crazy. But um, he's good enough to. He's got the talent to. Playing with like other guys in the first round. Do you? Think, yeah, he's up there. Do you think he uh, gets a higher selection than than what you just got picked at? <laughs> uh, I have no. I don't know. Would that bug you? Yes. <laughs> it it would bug me, but I'd be so happy for him. I wouldn't care. Yeah, there you go. Because the only reason it would bug me is because I know that he would just say, "I got picked higher than you." Yeah, hey, it, you know, I got anything, the tired in you, huh? If anything, you would just, that would stack the chip a little bit higher on your shoulder to go out there and have a better big league career than him, you know? Oh, no doubt. But in the short term, yes, it would bug me. Yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'd be so happy for him, it wouldn't matter. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's get into your high school experience. It was a uh-huh. little different for you being the oldest brother because you were the trailblazer. <laughs> um, uh-huh. But after what you accomplished, the name McLean was on the radar for Sean and Nick. You're not the biggest guy in the world. We we can yeah. acknowledge that. So I can only imagine yes. what you looked like at 14 or 15. Uh, when did <laughs> you start getting interest from colleges, and how did you end up picking UCLA? Uh, I started getting interest from colleges like kind of after my fresh midway through like my freshman high school season. Um, I was talking to a lot of schools on the West Coast, and then it started to gain traction after that next like summer that summer circuit not the junior one but like just going out and playing with different teams and kind of just playing against other guys who were going to colleges and then you know hitting well off some of those guys and stuff like that just continued to gain interest and then kind of once you get one college or a couple colleges talking to you like the other coaches start to figure it out and then they'll talk to you Uh, but I always knew I wanted to go to UCLA Uh, my dad played there we all grew up going to the games and we're all UCLA fans I, I know Sean's at ASU but um, we're a UCLA family and an ASU family now. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, got gotta show love for the devil. Oh yeah, I, I was wearing a I was wearing one. He gave me a couple uh, shirts and they're pretty sweet. I I rep them. Yeah, there you go. I and I swept them last year. But let's let's not forget about that. Gotta throw that in there. <laughs> Have to throw that in there. Um, you competed at the USA Baseball Tournament of Stars in 2017. <laughs> And uh-huh. you didn't make the 40-man trials roster. Uh, yeah. You weren't a PG All-American. You weren't an Under Armour All-American. Obviously, the Tournament of Stars is a big event in itself. You were an Area Codes guy. It felt like wherever you popped up during your 2017 summer, you hit. But was it a little frustrating, or did you feel like people weren't really taking notice? Um, It was frustrating, but at the same time, you know, I know, like... One of the biggest things that my parents have taught me is, you know, you control what you can control. I'm going to go out there and play hard and do what I can do um, for myself with those showcases Um, and in college, like for my team and pro ball for my team. But um, I was kind of going out there playing hard, having fun. And then, you know, whatever happened, happened after that. But yeah, I didn't get selected for any of that stuff. So I was just kind of like, all right, whatever. Chip on the shoulder, move, keep your head down, move on. And uh, get better from it. But yes, it was it was frustrating, but I used it to my advantage. Yeah, and you know, obviously I was around a lot of different high-level draft guys, whatever guys that didn't make the 40-man, guys that didn't make the 20-man, whatever, guys who weren't an All-American. Like that, for some reason, really bothers a lot <clears> of guys. Um, yeah. You're, you've, you've always seemed to be the most unbothered guy about all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you know you just, um, you just grab, yeah you, you grab your smoothie and you move on with your day <laughs> seriously <laughs> grab my cold brew smoothie and the guy didn't tell me i had coffee in it now i can't sit still yeah, but right. um <laughs> i'm I'm sitting here with a bat in my hands but um <laughs> yeah no i'm pretty like not laid back but you know i'm not gonna i try and control what i can and you know if it's out of my control it's out of my control what can i do next to help me improve is kind of the way that I look at it. Uh, we talked about it a little bit when we were eating dinner a month ago, but 
you know, let's let's talk about uh, 2018 draft night. Pick 21, mm-hmm. Team USA shortstop, 15U national team guy, 18U national team guy. Your area code teammate, Bryce Terang, mm-hmm. comes off the board to the Brewers, which is your local area code team. So all that yeah. makes sense. Kind of felt like that one was written in the stars for a while. Uh, mm-hmm. But four picks later at pick 25, the Arizona Diamondbacks take the non-All-American, non-40-man trials guy, shortstop uh, out of Southern California, Matt McClain. Did that surprise you at all? And how many teams were on you your senior year of high school? Um, There was a decent amount. Um, I'd say that like the Diamondbacks were probably the most interested. Um, but no, it didn't surprise me. Cause I knew like I was good enough, but at the same time it did because I wanted to go to college. <laughs> um, yeah, that's where I, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Like you legitimately wanted to go to college. Like I, I've talked to yeah. so many kids that are approaching the draft and they're like, Oh yeah, I really want to go to college. And it's like, <laughs> I, like, I, I can't, I can't tell you how insincere it sounds. <laughs> And then like, yeah. <laughs> later they they get drafted in the first round and they sign a day later and <laughs> yeah you know yeah the draft is crazy it's you don't know what's gonna happen but moral of the story on your entire high school career the most important people mm-hmm. took notice of your abilities on the baseball field UCLA when you were fourteen fifteen years old as a freshman and then the Arizona Diamondbacks despite you sincerely wanting to go to school and then following through on that, they, uh, they took you in the first round. So, um, signing deadline approaches. You're one of the few top 10 round picks that remains unsigned deadline passes and you're going to school. You know, we just talked about it. Was, you, was there any chance that you were going to sign or was it just like foregone conclusion? Like I'm going to UCLA. Oh yeah. No, I thought I was going to sign. Um, cause I thought, you know, my number was going to be met and then all the, and then it wasn't. And then I was like, no, no, I said, I said what I said and it wasn't met. So I'm going to school. I'm happy. I'm going to school. Awesome. But I, initially, yes, I thought I was going to sign. Yeah. That must just be like a, a roller coaster. It was, it was really weird. Cause it was like, you know, no contact till like a little bit before the deadline. And then I was like, well, I said this, that's not being met. I'm going to go to school. Yeah. And then you got to go to UCLA, which is your dream school and played from. Baseball. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah, you get to campus at UCLA, you play 61 games as a freshman mixed mm-hmm. results. Despite an underwhelming stat line, you were still able to do some damage. Um, did you feel pressure to contribute right away as the guy who got drafted in the first round and didn't sign? Um, no, I didn't feel pressure to contribute. I would say I put pressure on myself to be someone I wasn't. Um, not necessarily in a bad way, but like I kind of went about things in the wrong way. Like I wanted to get better <clears throat> when I was at UCLA, but like I didn't know, like the jump from high school to college is so big. And like, I don't think people realize that is how good some of those guys are. Cause you know, you go in there and a lot of the time in PAC 12, there's not many couple sophomores playing, maybe one freshman and the rest of the guys are juniors and seniors. They're four years older than you. And it's like, they know how to play the game. I didn't realize I didn't know how to play the game until I learned like a lot of the stuff that I learned at UCLA and in pro ball and continue to learn like to this day. Um, just in terms of, you know, approach like in the box, um, and even like stuff outside of that, like how to take care of your body, um, how to sleep, like nutrition, just so many things that I didn't know going into it at UCLA and then kind of like learning them. It was very overwhelming. And then the mixed results, the not even mixed, the bad results, <laughs> um, started coming. It was like, Whoa, Whoa, Whoa. Like I need to like slow down and, and take things a little bit slower. Yeah, and I mean, kind of throw another wrench into all of that. You know, you were playing a position that you didn't play every day or much of at all. Uh, yeah, I never played center field before. Yeah, and they're just like, all right, you're a freshman, like, go play center field. 
Yeah, the, and that was very different, but I liked it. And I know that I can play center field now. Not that I want to. I love short stuff. But um, it's like just something I know and I have confidence in. Because, I, I mean, I, I was fine out there. It's just in the box. <laughs> You're basically like the Irish American version of Kike Hernandez. Yeah, he's a stud. Yeah, you got you got the energy, you got the ability to play center field and shortstop. I mean, like, what else do you need? Yeah, <laughs> you just need some really tight pants. He's got some really tight pants. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, he rakes. Yeah, and and still does, and it's it's nice to see him play every day for the Red Sox after being a utility guy for the Dodgers. But yeah. Let's uh let's talk about after your freshman year. You head up okay. to uh Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and it seemed like uh-huh. you found your footing a little bit with the wood bat. You batted three hundred mm-hmm. for most of the summer and then kind of yeah. to, like the last week, finished at two seventy four, which is very respectable for a freshman on the Cape. Was that a shot of confidence after what you accomplished in Wareham? Yeah, that um it for sure was because I knew that like that was like one of the best or the best summer league out there. It was wood bat. And I kind of like found my groove for a little bit. Like you said, made the all-star team and then skidded completely skid after the all-star break. But I learned a lot out there and I learned how to simplify things. I learned how to like process information better from Jerry Weinstein. Um, he kind of taught me like how to filter things and how to make it like, like you learn something, you have to like communicate it to your coach, see if it works and like just how to process it and, and make it my own and how to throw away things that I don't like. Um, just kind of how to learn, like learn baseball. Um, he was really good at teaching me that and how, how to simplify it and dumb it down because I'm very simple. Like, <laughs> like you said earlier. Um, so I kind of got to simplify things and, you know, think like one thought if there's like a cue in the box or something like that. Yeah, and for anybody listening who doesn't know who Jerry Weinstein is, uh, hit a quick Google search on that. But that guy seems like he's just everywhere. He, he's yeah, I love Jerry. Yeah, you look over your shoulder. <laughs> he is Jerry Weinstein. Um, that's awesome <laughs> that you had the experience to get coached by him. Because yeah, it was it was great. I mean, he was out there like I think we played at like most games at six. It was like early work at twelve if you want it tomorrow. So I was like, yeah, hell yeah, like sign me up. Like I'll see you there. Yeah, the guys. And it was like, whatever you want. And then he would, he's like, what do you want? I'm like, oh, ground balls. Uh, Sometimes he'd tell me nothing, just reps. And then sometimes he'd, I'd find something. I'd be like, oh, that's sick. That works. The guy's a living baseball artifact, you know, put him in a museum. Yeah, he is. (laughs) Seriously. Um, Are you still in contact with him at all or? Uh, Every now and then he's, he called me a little bit. He called me a lot over the quarantine period just to kind of talk. Um, I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but sometimes he'll randomly call me or text me and we'll chat it up a little bit. Yeah, because does he still live out in Southern California? I think he was up in, what, San Luis Obispo? Yeah, uh, slow. I don't know if he still lives there. I, I'm sure he does, though. That was like last year he was living there. Yeah. But um, oh, how was the overall experience on Cape Cod? Like, had you ever been to the Northeast part of the United States before? And kind of speaking to a college kid right now, would you recommend that experience? Yeah. Um, I went to the Northeast a couple times, like for the Cooperstown tournament when we were kids with that Diamond Devils team I talked about. We went like twice, visited Boston, um, actually went to a game on the Cape. I think it was it was a blue and orange team. So it was either Hyannis or Chatham. I don't remember which one. But I do remember I went to a game. I have a signed hat of like all the players somewhere. Um, but yes, that was one of the best experiences I had, like baseball and off the field. I mean, where is different than everywhere else for sure, but I got better and had like more fun than I ever had. Um, a lot of summers I, I had fun every summer, but that place was a lot of fun. It was really good guys, really good competition and just the atmosphere of like playing on the Cape, you know, you get fans, good weather, just a fun place to be. What's a food item that you got up while living in Wareham um, that maybe you'd never had before or that is entirely different than uh, what you experienced with that food item back in California? Um, that's a good question. 
I don't even know. Did you notice that like the pizza was a little different? <laughs> well, so get this. So my like host family was like the other way of the Cape. So like where I'm already off the Cape. So my host family was like 25 minutes the further off the Cape. So after the games, like we'd have like something, me and my roommate, he had a, he brought his truck. He was from uh, South Carolina. And so we would get something to eat like real quick after the game from like the team. And then like we'd be hungry again, like halfway through the drive. So we would stop at like a, like a Chick-fil-A or a Arby's. Like I, that sounds pretty bad, but it was like most nights. That's like the, that, that sounds so where I am. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, and then wake up in the morning have with the other <laughs> nine clubs you know like <laughs> i know if you're and then there, it's not like there's an arby's or a chick-fil-a for you to hit you know <laughs> i know it's yeah it was definitely very where am and then get this and then in the mornings most mornings like half of the mornings we get up go to dunkin donuts and then work the summer camps well at least you it was your, gritty at, yeah at least you got your dunkin yeah, that, that that was money. Uh, last question about Wareham. Um, okay. Did you enjoy playing on the gravel infield? I did. I mean, like, it was fairly normal. Like, it was obviously a little bit different, but it was something different. I never did it before. I, I hear so many so if people I ever see gravel. About, I hear so many people complain about the gravel. I mean, yeah, it's, like, tough, but people just use it as an excuse. Like, it's when it gets beat up it's actually really tough but like you're just gonna go field ground balls on it like in the early parts of the game later in the game when people are running across it and their cleats take about four inches out of the ground there's a a couple craters right in front of you you just gotta charge it and field it one-handed uh other than that it's good had you ever seen a gravel infield before before wareham never never yeah, I guess uh, that's something that, you know, growing up in Massachusetts, every once in a while you come across a gravel infield and you wouldn't think twice about it, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, a couple of UCLA guys went there the year before and they told me about it. And uh, so I had a little prior knowledge. Yeah, I remember when I was interning up on the Cape, there was a UCLA shortstop there that was pretty good. Uh, actually, Yeah, Kreidler. Yeah, Kreidler. Um, yeah, UCLA's got a pretty good... Pretty good history sending guys to Wareham. Yeah, they do. But uh all right, let's let's jump ahead of your Cape year, twenty twenty, COVID year, thirteen games in. You're batting almost four hundred. Your OPS is up mm-hmm. over a thousand. It's all clicking. And then the season gets banged. Long layoff, and then twenty twenty one you get a little dinged up, you break your thumb in May, but all in all, you don't really skip a beat. 333 OPS uh-huh. north of a hunt or north of a thousand. You walked as much as you struck out. All your starts came at shortstop. Seems about as Matt McLeanian as it comes. Talk about the long layoff between 2020 and 2021, and then how yeah. you did. How did you feel heading into the draft process round two? Yeah, so like that long like season gets canceled. Um, there's like a rule where like you can't four more than four guys can't go to a summer team the only leagues that are open are the california league and uh, the northwoods and coach had called me asking if i want to go to the northwoods and i'm like no i'm good and then and then um the someone like canceled the rule i don't know if it was ncaa or or what up and then uh the foresters opened up there was four four ucla guys going already so i couldn't go and then they opened up and uh, Pinner, the coach over there, called me asking if I wanted to play with, with Sean, and it was a no-brainer because I just wanted to play baseball. Um, I didn't care where. I mean, Santa Barbara was a good spot, but um, I really just wanted to play baseball. And then that season ended, and then I had a bunch of time here still um, with my brothers, and that's when there was a lot of golf because you could still golf during COVID. Um, and just a lot of downtime, which was was boring but again i had sean and nick here which was it was there was always something to do um but then going into that draft um it was it was different in a way because like not i'm not gonna say like i knew i was gonna get drafted or anything but like 
I kind of knew what to expect heading into it because it was going to be, I knew what was coming in high school. I didn't know what was coming. If that's a good way of saying it. Like I knew that like there was like scout meetings and stuff like that. And high school was all of a sudden like, Oh, one scout hit me up saying he wants to have an in-home meeting. And I didn't even have an agent at the time. I'm like, yeah, sure. Whatever. Like and I didn't know what it was. And then next thing you know, you meet with 30 teams and then the draft happens. I didn't have like a draft party or anything in high school. We were just kind of watching the draft with like a couple people, a couple of my close friends. And then in college, I had like a whole on draft party with a bunch of people here. Um, so it was different. I knew what to expect. And then like, I didn't change anything like, like trying to not think about it or anything like that. I just wanted to like play baseball and control what I can and let the draft take care of itself. Yeah, and kind of fill in some context around, you know, kind of what you're saying, right? Like, out of high school, it's a little different because you've got this commitment to college in your head, you're mm-hmm. going to college. Um, and they're like, for people listening that aren't overly familiar with the draft, like 80 to 90% of kids that are selected in the top 10 rounds of the draft, and really the whole draft, are college guys. And, you know, to your point, like, after three years at UCLA, well, two, two seasons and a couple weeks with the, the COVID year. But regardless, when you were draft eligible in college, that's kind of like if you had a good year, the, the expectation is that, you know, you're getting drafted and you're going to sign just like the 90% of other college guys every other year. So, um, yeah, I can, I can definitely understand where you're coming from in terms of, you know, setting up the draft party and doing all that stuff because yeah, that's the largest pool of players that's selected every year in the draft or what you were in college, you know? Yeah. So um, the 2021 MLB draft was late, and I think that might be the new status quo, but it was held during all-star festivities in Denver. You got Uh selected 17th overall by the Reds, becoming Uh a two-time first-round pick, a rarity in it of itself, and you moved up eight spots to boot from when you're drafted in high school just mm-hmm. real quick thoughts on being a first rounder twice because i can think of maybe one other and i know there's probably a handful more but it's pretty rare like it's cool but like i don't really care i mean at the end of the day like i'm going out there and competing a bunch of the guy on the mound doesn't care where i was drafted like it's cool though like for sure but like at the same time it's like you got to move on from it, but it is cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other one I could think of, uh, was Phil Bickford. Um, I don't know if you know that name, but he was another SoCal. Uh-uh. Guy. He was a SoCal guy. He went to, I think he went like 10th overall to the blue Jays. And then he went to Cal state Fullerton. And then he went up to the Cape after his freshman year and he was just unhittable. And he got named really the best pro prospect on the Cape. Then he transferred to, College of Southern Nevada so that he was immediately draft eligible again. He was a uh, pitcher? Yeah, he was a pitcher. He had a really nasty curveball. He actually uh, – he's bounced around quite a bit in pro ball uh-huh. and uh, ended up in the Dodgers bullpen at the end of this season. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, so that's – I think currently where he's at right now is coming out of the bullpen for the Dodgers. But um, we <laughs> – I could tell you some stories about Bickford uh, off the air. Um, at another time, he's an interesting cat, but yeah. Um, let's uh, let's talk about your intro to pro ball. After mm-hmm. two games at the complex, you had the high A and mm-hmm. status quo. You basically replicate your Cape Cod stat line in your first pro season. How was the transition from UCLA to pro ball? You talked about going from high school to UCLA. Uh, let's talk uh-huh. about going from UCLA to pro ball, especially high A. And uh, what are your expectations for yourself in 2022? Um, the transition was tough, um, like on the field for sure, because like I also was the last one to sign in my draft class. I think I might have been like last or second to last. So I had like, it was like two full months till I, I think like played in a game from like the regionals to ACL. Um, when I played my first game there, it might've been two months from the first game I played in Dayton or the ACL. I'm not sure. 
but it, it wasn't like a short amount of time. So I was like hitting every day. Cause I knew I was going to go out and play. Um, cause I was like healthy. My thumb felt good. And, um, I wanted to stay in shape cause I wanted to go out there and, and do well, obviously. Um, but it was different. Like pitchers are a lot different. You know, you're not, you don't have a pitching coach calling your game. Pitchers are calling the games. Um, a lot more stuff up there in high A at least. Um, less command, but like the game's similar, just different in a lot of ways, at least like in terms of that way, you don't have like, you're on your own. Like you got to get better yourself. No one's hounding, not hounding. No one's like telling you like what to do before a game necessarily. Um, you got to like grow up as a baseball player and figure out what works for you, how to get your body ready before the game, how to get your mind ready before the game, how to play the game. Um, it's different. Um, talent levels are similar. Pro ball was probably a little bit better than the UCLA I would compare it to, but um, it was different, but it was a lot of fun. And then what, what was the second part of that? Uh, the second part of that was what your expectations are for yourself in 2022, but let's put that on pause for a second. Okay. You brought up that in pro ball, it's a lot more, you know, you kind of have to go do it for yourself in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, your preparation and your, your routine and your process on a day to day. Do you think that you would have handled it differently if you signed out of high school versus having a couple of years to prep and everything that you talked about, you learned at UCLA? Um, yeah. How did that prepare you for pro ball? Uh, very well. Um, I think I like people ask me that a lot and I would have been, extremely lost out of high school like i like for example like in high school i didn't even know what a routine was like i knew what a routine was but like you know what i mean i didn't know that like people go in there hit off the tee then do flips and then like have a couple drills during flips and then go hit off bp then hit off a machine like some people have those crazy long routines i'm pretty simple but like in high school like the rule was you couldn't like hit a ball thrown overhand before a game so before a game, we would have guys on a knee on the side hitting softballs, and I would hit, like, seven or eight balls and be like, I'm good. Like, you couldn't hit BP before a game, at least in our league, in our, in our division, um, which was crazy. Like, I would literally – it was literally like a show-and-go every day. You'd show up, like, hour and a half before, uh, get ready, stretch, play catch, uh, take infield, outfield, then hit eight balls, then go play. <laughs> eight softballs. <laughs> Literally, like squishy balls on a knee, someone's flipping them, and they had to be like inside 45 degrees or like you could forfeit the game. Like it was the stupidest rule I've ever heard. But like in high school, like I never thought about it. I was like, yeah, like let's go, give me eight. Dang. That's yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Um, all right. So, so let's go back to the second part of that question. What, what are your uh -huh. expectations for yourself in 2022? You know, obviously, you had a good year. Uh, a good debut, high A, um, you know, just kind of talk about what, what your plan is for this year. And again, for yourself, not necessarily, you know, there's a lot of other things that are out of your control that'll dictate what yeah. happens. But. Yeah, I just want to, like, wherever I am, where, wherever I'm playing, I just want to be better than I was last year. Um, I have, We have a friend, Eddie Gordado, he pitched in the big leagues for a long time, and I talked to him about, like, goals going into a season like what do you set your goals as um when like when you were playing because he played 18 years and he's like i just want to be better than the year i was before um and I, I knew if i did that i'd keep playing the game and like i don't know that really hit with me because a lot of guys are like you know i want to hit 310 with 24 bombs and and whatever but like that's just chasing the game the game's gonna eat you alive if you do that so I just want to be a better player than I was last year. I feel like I did that all throughout college. Um, whether the numbers reflect that or not, I feel like I got better every single year, every single season from freshman year to summer ball, fall ball to the, to the spring. Um, and that really comes from hard work and focus. And it's kind of like believing in myself and getting after it every single day and trying to get a little bit better. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, and we can't wait to see you get back on field and ma manifest that into reality. Um, Absolutely. We talked a lot about baseball. Let's talk a little bit about the off season aside from, yeah. from 2k and, uh, 
espresso fueled smoothies. Um, I, I want to talk about something that's that's kind of serious because you know this is something I encountered encountered a lot with the high school group. Um, you know, everyone had a different person to work out with and a different way to work out and whatever. And you had some guys that were doing football workouts and you had some guys that were doing, you know, baseball specific workouts and you had other guys that were doing, you know, specifically Olympic lifts and there are all kinds of different ways that guys were getting stronger, um, in high school. And there's always this conversation about, well, you need to train in the gym for your sport specifically and you've got a guy in your backyard uh who yep. you've known for a long time and all your brothers work out with him josh wright at uh, wright fitness systems in costa mesa mutual friend of both of ours how long have you known josh and talk a little bit about the types of workouts you do in there and why they're beneficial for baseball players yeah we were talking about this the other day i think it was like uh sophomore to junior summer or it might have been junior year or uh, junior year, call it junior year. Um, I started to go in there. He hit me up on Twitter and then I started to go in there, um, before school at 6 AM and it was tough. Um, but I had friends in there, like good, good group of guys in there during that time and still now, but, um, I've known Josh for a while, you know, he's always got me right. He's, I've always felt good going in every season, feeling strong, um, feeling like an athlete. Like I got, I can't be like too bulked up or lose athleticism or you know too skinny or anything like that so i feel like he's got me right every season he continues to i love his workouts um we do everything from you know compound lifts like deadlift squat um things like that to like arm care stuff um it's a good it's a good mixture of like strength building and uh like flexibility and keeping mobile at the same time um i really like that and the only injury i've had it was a uh, broke my thumb last year knock on wood yeah and uh i had an opportunity to go through one of his uh recovery offerings when i was out there last time i know that you were golfing that day but um, yeah i'm sure you've been in there for a couple of those and again those are the the little things that people take for granted and they don't really do yeah everyone thinks that like oh like i'm young i don't need to stretch i don't need to do this whatever but um, that's the stuff, those little routines you do and that type of stuff that gives you the longevity, you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it really does. It's, it's important that you don't start stretching or recovering, uh, when you actually need it. So, um, yeah, but I met Josh back in 2017 through a conversation with Nick Prado, uh, in Cary mm-hmm. during the, uh, national high school invitational. He was one of the yeah. first. I think he was the first guy who mentioned you to me when I was at USA baseball. And I remember your athletic testing being really good. The first time we tested you, uh, out mm-hmm. in Compton, both from like a raw athleticism standpoint, but also from a lower half symmetry perspective. And that's something that I've continued to see, uh, in guys that, you know, he tested over the years while I was doing the PDP stuff. But I think it was a week or two, before the tournament of stars in 2017 was that event Compton. Um, you went through the athletic testing that summer multiple times. We got you again in February, 2018, uh, when you were a high school senior before the draft and then mm-hmm. again during the summer of 2019 on the Cape. And then again, most recently, uh, a month ago, beginning of December at Josh's gym, talk a little bit about what you've learned from looking at your athletic data over the years. Yeah. Yeah. You sent me that, you set me up with that, which was sweet. Thanks again for that. Um, but like the athletic or the symmetry and like both the legs is something that I looked at. Cause I like thought about it. I'm like, cause like guys run like that's, I was thinking about like that and injury specifically. Cause my numbers were close. I was like, I need to keep that close because my left leg stronger than my right. I'm going to run like sideways and like chance of injury goes up. Um, but the, um, the like the single leg in the box jump like uh, what's that called? That's the uh, the drift two D protocol. The single leg jumps. You can just call it single. I leg think jumps. my num- Yeah, the single leg jumps. Um, well, like when I did them, I thought like my numbers were gonna be good, but like they were just average or something like that. Which was because like all that testing is like really like foreign to me, and like it's good to have like you because like you break that down for me like when we were at dinner and stuff like that and like you break it down on the report um but yeah like 
all that stuff, like the technology stuff to me is like out there and hard, not hard for me to understand, but just kind of like hard to grasp all at once. Um, so it's good. Like I give it to Josh and then like Josh looks at it. It's like, okay, okay. Like we can work on this. This is what helps with this. This is what helps with this. So it's really good to have that and use it to communicate because like it's only useful if I use it and he uses it um, to get myself better. Yeah. And that was one of the biggest things that uh, we were trying to do, you know, when we started loading sports, you know, obviously I did the PDP thing for almost four years. And one of my biggest frustrations was exactly your experience and, you know, you're, you know, obviously a bright dude, you know, it's UCLA, which is, you know, they actually check your, uh, your GPA and your standardized <laughs> testing scores before they, you know, let you in there and on a baseball field. Um, yeah. And you're interested in statistics. We'll get into that in a second. But, um, yeah, like it's, it's super science heavy. It's really tough to process. And I think for us, we're like, okay, this stuff's important, but we can't sit down with every player that gets tested for two hours and break it down for them. Um, how yeah. do we make this simple and concise? And that's kind of where we've gotten to. So, um, <laughs> I mean, yeah, obviously we've had the conversations when it was, I sat down with you and, you know, talked you through it when it was really sciencey and tough to explain and, you know, definitely really appreciated, you know, you being open and willing to listen to those conversations. Um, cause yeah. a lot of, a lot of people just kind of space out and, you know, continue on with their day, kind of nod their head, whatever it may be. But yeah, you know, you've always, uh, you've always been really interested in it, which, you know, I, I can appreciate. So, um, thanks at the very least for humoring me, but it does sound like <laughs> <laughs> you find some value in the athletic data. Oh yeah. Like I, I love all that data, like the data in the game. Like I want to see it. I want to be told, I don't want to like, like if it makes sense. Like I want someone who understands it to tell me how to, how to dumb it down so I can understand it. Like, you know, like, you know, that data so well, you dumb it down for me and I go, okay, yeah, I understand that now. Yeah, it's like, you know, if if you if you looked at each piece of data in baseball, because there's so much of it, whether it's the batted ball data or, you know, biomechanical data or whatever it is, you look at each one as like a book. It's like you don't have time every day to read five different books. So you need like the spark notes on like five different things, you know? Yeah, exactly. But, um, you know, kind of in the same vein, you know, how important – is athleticism on a baseball field in your perspective extremely important because just like if you're an athlete it's just another part of like like there's a there's baseball players and like an athlete like i feel like you got to be both to be like a really good baseball player you can't just be like a good baseball not say that baseball players aren't athletes because they are um but i'm trying to like word it the right way I don't know. You just have to be athletic to play baseball. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I hear you. Um, some of the most athletic guys, you know, regardless of professional sport are baseball players. I'm of the belief having looked at a lot of athletic data and a lot of high level division one football players actually came through that PDP program as multi-sport athletes. Um, yeah. Like, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, like there's there's a guy who's who just declared for the NFL draft. He, you know, was a running back at Ole Miss, and uh, you know, you probably remember him. I think he was a, a draft year after you. But regardless, okay. like his stuff was really good. But it's not like it was like, oh yeah, you can tell this guy's the football player. You know, yeah, you run him alongside a handful of baseball players, and there's guys that keep up in the realm of power, speed you know, quick twitch, all those different things with a guy who's playing running back in the SEC. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think, you know, the, the top athletes, regardless of sport, find their way to the top, you know, the top of their sport. So, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, the UCLA website had your favorite subject as statistics, which I didn't know. Um, but our first no. guest, Corbin Carroll, once a UCLA uh -huh. himself, uh, he's told me a number of times that he's gone down the rabbit hole of analyzing his own baseball data. 
just curious. Really? Yeah. Do you, uh, he, he actually did it for a class cause he's, I think he's enrolled at Arizona state now. Um, yeah, the online, a lot of, um, a lot of minor league guys who signed out of high school, like go do the ASU online. Yeah. And he told me for one of his classes that, you know, he's, he's like, I'm, I'm 16 pages deep in analyzing my own baseball data. And he's telling me like his swing tendencies, like in and out of the zone. And he's like, really way more success if I don't chase. And, you know, <laughs> balls that I make contact with that are out of the zone. I have like a, you know, whatever, super low batting average on those balls. So I need to like make sure I don't make contact and swing at pitches. I, you know, the whole nine, but um, yeah. Do you ever dive into any of your own numbers? Uh, I like to like look at them, like if they're simple enough, like that, like if I go too deep into it, I, I get in my own head. So like, <laughs> I, I like to know them and like, keep it simple. I'm very, very simple on the baseball field. And if I don't, I get in trouble. Yeah. I think you kind of touched on that a little bit and we just talked about it just in terms of all the different data sources out there. Um, and yeah. <laughs> trying to like, make sure that you keep your head as clear as possible. Um, yeah, exactly. But, uh, you know, getting away from baseball statistics and all of that. You talked about it before uh, when COVID hit that, you know, the golf courses stayed open. So you're a golfer now. Are you any good? Uh, I'm a 12 handicap. All right. So I'm all right. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can get better. I just got some new clubs. I got uh, some Titleist T300s. They should be coming any day. So I'm stoked on that. Yeah. So you have any uh... – any plans to play in a pro am anytime soon? I'm not that good. <laughs> just, my, just, my best club is my arm. Yeah, just just wait a couple of years and you'll be playing in the Pebble Beach Pro Am. Yeah, if I uh if I can get my driver straight. My driver's the most fun club to hit, but I'm probably the worst at it. I play golf with uh Max Schrock. I don't know if you, you probably know Max cuz he's a he's a red um, I've heard the name. I I haven't met him. Anyway, he's a local guy here in Raleigh, and I played golf with him back in the fall. And uh, really, yeah, he he hits his driver a country mile, but uh, I think he only hit the fairway like once or twice. Hopefully, he doesn't listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's me. I'm once or twice if I'm lucky. Yeah, it's spray and pray. I was just like, <laughs> you know, two fifty. So hard to keep it in the bag. <laughs> so hard to keep that club in the bag. Yeah, I mean, like. You know, if you're going to pay to play golf, you might as well bring it out, you know? Absolutely. You didn't bring the driver out to collect dust, but any big plans before spring training other than playing golf? Uh, No. Honestly, no. Yeah, bulletproof the hamstrings. Yeah, bulletproof the hamstrings. I need to get back on that. Get a little bit faster, a little stronger. Um, But no, no plans. Well, that's that's a good way to be. Stay focused. Exactly. Um, I Folk, want to open it up to some to of the listeners here who might have some questions. Uh, they uh, might not. We'll see. Uh, but one last thing before we turn it over to the crowd. And I always say, like, learn how to cook and you'll never have a bad meal in your life. One, do you cook for yourself? If yes, what's your favorite thing to make? And uh, of the three brothers, who's the best cook? I won't say me this time, but yes, um, I cook for myself when I need to. I'm living at home right now, so my mom cooks dinner a lot. Um, but you know, middle of the day, breakfast, um, I'll cook for myself. Um, I really like making like eggs, hash browns, and bacon or sausage or something like that in the morning. Um, get the day going good. But Sean's the best cook. Um, I also like making steak. Um, Sean cooks for himself the most and he's the best. What's like his signature dish? He's so random. Like he'll literally just like come home. Like, I don't know. He doesn't have a signature dish, but like, he's just so random. Like he'll just come home with like eight patties, throw them on the grill. Be like you want some burgers? Like, yeah. <laughs> like, sure. Like where'd that come from? Not mad about it. You know, if someone's going to, I'm not mad about it. And the next, like, and then he'll like throw in some like uh, ground beef in the on the stove, and just twenty minutes later, he's like, "You want some tacos?" I'm like, "Yeah, sure." <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So shout out to Nick Sean. doesn't cook for himself. Yeah, shout out to Sean. Nick's uh, 
he's really good at the making a bagel in the toaster. If you count that. <laughs> oh man, that's a that's a gem right there. <laughs> um, all right, Maddie, we covered a lot in an hour. It's it's too bad we couldn't have um, done this one in the dugout in Compton. But yeah, seriously, to hop on with us. Let's do it again. Maybe next time we'll get absolutely uh, Cam and Cole on here too.